That takes me on to one of the concepts that uh, was put forward by Ms. Mohammed, the issue of accountability. Uh, account who is accountable for what in the international forum? forum when we speak of the, 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 the goals? Who is accountable? And also, you spoke of the need for data, and I couldn't uh, underscore that more, uh, the need for the metrics. And when we speak of the need for the metrics, I think implied with Barcelona's comment was well, we need a different metric when we come to our countries. The metrics used to graduate our countries from uh, middle income, from uh, uh, low income, middle income countries are not appropriate metrics. Could, would you, would you uh, in, the, in the forum of the United Nations, do these things resonate or can they resonate? Well, for the first time, the whole accountability discourse has been one that's become really interesting because. Uh, one of the first questions has been, how do we um, grapple with the accountability of rhetoric, just what we're hearing now. Um, and when we come to uh, all through the process of arguing why we need the different goals and what we need to do as a global village, it has been about what developing countries probably need to do most. Um, and I'll, I'll take up the, the tax issue when we talked about domestic resource mobilization being really what would be the sustainability of this, that we actually grow that, that we don't have to make these choiceless choices between health and education or infrastructure um, and, and water supply. These were, were questions that are brought up, illicit flows, uh, tax evasion, uh, all these were up in front center of this, this discourse. But we come to the financing for development to agree the response to that then comes where the proof is at the meeting of the pudding. Will we put on the table those issues that need to be dealt with? And tax, for instance, um, how we address that? Is it just the domain of where we will discuss the standards and norms exclusively? Or will we bring in everyone that has a role and a responsibility to play in making that happen? Um, so that, that has been a, you know, a, a very strong um, uh, demand, I think, of, of the new, this is a universal agenda. But accountability has taken on different forms now because it's moved from where we had it when we, were, when we were delivering on the MDGs, which is much about what we do in developing countries to respond to what we may get to help us out of poverty from developed countries. Um, to one where we're talking about rights and obligations, doing no harm. The new stakeholders that we are engaging with now, it's not just about government's responsibility to its people, but it's also about people to planet, it's about business to people and planet, it is about, um, it's about, as the PM said to us this morning, um, if we're not listening to the planet, then there's going to be a problem. If we're not listening to people and exclusion, there's going to be a problem. Um, and so in terms of accountability setting, um, the, the platforms, the indicators, uh, the measures that we want, uh, defining it in the different ways that we have, is a very, I think, it's a uh, certainly a very difficult um, uh, set of issues that are being debated right now. Concerns are that we have a set of goals. We will hopefully have a financing framework that makes some sense in response to, to get this big agenda off. Um, but right now, we don't have agreement on what that accountability framework would look like. In what we might add is not a legally binding agreement. That makes it even more difficult because how much you take there, how much you, you, you bring back in terms of those commitments, really difficult. Um, the the uh, the issues of the, the political and the economic tensions are very much there in all of these different discussions. And until we put those on the table, um, I think, frankly, as, as my sister of a different mother talks to um, the debt relief, um, this is a... That sister of a different mother. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, the issues around debt relief, they have the leadership and the courage to really put this bang on the table and push it and not have a quiet voice about it is important. Um, I can talk about my country, Nigeria. When we put debt relief on the table, it was, a, it was an issue that took years to get off, but it was um, consistent leadership by the president who knocked on every door, bowed and scraped in every courtyard until he got what he needed. But what he got, he had to be accountable to two. He did have to be accountable to those who gave the debt relief, because certainly there was a track record of governments not being responsible for resources they had. 
But the more important people you have to be accountable to are Nigerian people. Mm. And really finding a way um, to say, these are the checks and balances we're putting in. This is the line item in the budget that is incremental to where we need to go and that we will do what we need to do. So I think a lot more discussion on, first of all, I, I keep saying this, let's start inside. What do we mean and want to define by accountability? And not have it defined for us. And then go to the table and as a, as a global village and partnership, then begin to define what those key elements are to making that so. Before I come, I'm going to come on and ask uh, this person of this. Uh, we have the, the general thesis that uh, the issue of uh, debt relief is one that is an imperative for citizen general. There's a view by the minister that this must not be seen as inimical to discussion about the commercial. So it's a two-pronged approach. How do you react to that? No, I think he has a very important point. I mean, this issue has to be done, I guess, and this is why I wanted to intervene now, to say that I think we have a powerful, a powerful case here and that we need to work it together. And if no agency can do it, I know it. So my point is here, my proposal here, to the CARICOM heads of state, they have to give a powerful mandate to who? To CARICOM, of course. To the Commonwealth, of course. To the CDB. To us, ECLAS, yes. And to the IMF, and the World Bank, and the IDB, and the bilaterals, and the multilaterals. Why? Because we need everybody around the table to find the best ways out without compromising, as you very much say, the future lending processes of the current year. But let me tell you something on indicators, which I think is very relevant. Uh, the indicator of GDP per capita is the one being used for middle income countries. Wrong. We have to stand against this. We have to make sure that everybody understands that the middle income countries have structural gaps that can be very clearly measurable. Uh, gaps like, for example, the foreign direct investment that is coming to the Caribbean went down from 12% to 7%. I mean, the access to foreign direct investment is going to be more difficult now than ever. And of course, the race to the bottom is taking, not taking us nowhere. We're giving more and more concessions to the, the, the transnational corporation. Come on, we have to sit around the table with the, with the transnational corporation. And we have to make sure that they pay taxes, by the way. No, I mean, of course, all of us should, but, but there's transnational corporations as well. So, uh, and, and this is the private sector that you're talking about as well. And they are worried, I have to say. I have been in touch with many of the extractive industries. They are also concerned that they cannot be only rent-seeking and taking everything away. They have to come to the table and discuss this matter. So, my point here is, of course, our suggestion is to have a gradual write-off of the multilateral debt. That will need donors, that will need uh, countries, that will need the, the multilateral. The second option is to have interest payments exchange for capital investment in the local, in the domestic economies. That has to be a commitment, of, of, again, between the creditors and the local countries. The third one is how do we have a part of the debt service to, to agree capital expenditure. So there are options out there that have been studied, by the way, by the Commonwealth. We read your paper, and if the, if the multilateral debt is right off for the Commonwealth countries, we are talking about $800 million. It's not that much, but with our Caribbean, it's everything. So what I'm trying to say is that, why do I think this is the year to do this? Because everybody's thinking about financing for development. Okay. The only way to open up space for financing for development in middle-income countries like the Caribbean is to have a debt reduction. What else? Because you're not going to get concessional funds because ODA is not coming to our region. Just let me give you three figures and I stop here. The foreign direct investment that is coming to the whole of Latin America and the Caribbean last year was 160 billion. The flow of illicit funding out of Latin America in tax exemptions, solutions, and what have you arise to 150 billion, okay? Almost the same. OTA coming to our region is 10 billion. That is 15 times less. And money coming from remittances from migrants is 66 billion. Do we want to be financed by our poor people that are out there? 
Do we want to be financed by the foreign direct investment, or do we want to be financed by ourselves? But we need to close what the, our friend, the historian, said here, which I agree very much. Equality means to close the asymmetries between developed and developing countries. And we have to sit around the table to do this. Equality from the perspective of ECLA means the following. 90 persons in the planet have the wealth equal to 3,500 million people. Half of the population of the planet has the same wealth as 99.0 individuals. Isn't that important? What are we talking about? Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I would like the audience to uh, believe that all the problems are uh, economic, although this is very, uh, terribly important. Is one aspect, that, before I open the floor to the discussion, the two questions I'm going to raise. One, to uh, Sir Hillary, is in relationship between the SIDS, uh, generally the CARICOM and the South Pacific countries, for example, the Secretary General mentioned the areas of education, etc., etc. What have been, has been the progress in that sense uh, in the Caribbean? Uh, uh, so, George, we have a, uh, a very serious uh, crisis in the Caribbean context in respect of education. If you consider, if you consider, for example, the age cohort 18 to 30, we heard about the young people and the need not to sacrifice the futures of the young people. But if you take the age cohort 18 to 30, uh, we in the Caribbean, we have the lowest enrollment in higher education in the entire hemisphere. Um, so if you take from Alaska to Argentina and you look at our young people who are, are participating in higher education, we are at the bottom of the hemisphere pile. Now, this is a serious issue. Now, it is even more serious when you realize that a country's or a region's potential for sustainable development is to a large extent an expression of how many of its citizens have participated or are participating in professional training, vocational studies, higher education research. We are in a hemisphere. Uh, at the bottom of the hemisphere in that regard. So, looking then at the future of the region, through the eyes of a, an educator, we are in great, great difficulty. In fact, I will go one step further and suggest that one of the reasons why our economies are also the most sluggish in the hemisphere in terms of recovering from this recession is precisely because uh, our citizens' participation and all of these areas of education, of training, professional development skills, it is, it is pitifully low. Uh, and one can conclude that the, the, the primary drag on Caribbean economic development at the moment is, is not a shortage of capital. It is, a, it is a shortage of skills in critical areas. And, and we do have a, a serious shortage of critical skills in critical areas. That is holding us back in many regards. And it is only a, a revolution in, in professional training, skills development, research, innovation that can drive our countries out of this out of this situation. But I think we have to again go back to the, the moral imperative. The Caribbean is not only uh, in possession of an economic circumstance that is described as a crisis. We have a moral problem in the Caribbean. The Western world, Western Europe especially, has extracted so much wealth out of this Caribbean over 500 years that if you, if you take the, the 18th and 19th centuries, it was Caribbean wealth that was used to balance the budgets of Western Europe. It was Caribbean extracted wealth that gave Western Europe the surplus to generate economic development. And yet, at this moment, they've walked away from it, and they have left it in the state. Only the Prime Minister of Jamaica is here. Jamaica became the most dynamic economy in the Caribbean in the 18th and 19th centuries. But when the British walked away from Jamaica in 1962, they left the Jamaican people with 80% illiteracy. 
and they were told, go and develop. How on earth can any country develop a sustainable economy with an 80% illiteracy? It is impossible. But the Jamaican people have done very, very well. So from the point of view of the debt, I think there's a moral issue. It's not only a technical issue. I think the Western, the Western world, especially the Western parts of Europe, have a moral obligation. It is staring them in the face that they have left the Caribbean in an awful circumstance. We have done our best through self-reliance and through leadership. We have taken it some ways, and we've done well. But they need to come back and work on this issue, and debt abandonment is one of the first things that they must do. One of the things that uh, uh, I know that uh, your university, our university, is doing in relationship to SIDS is engaging in education across the ocean. In other words, joint education approaches uh, between the South Pacific and the University of the West Indies, which I think are very well uh, for the future. I know uh, there's a lot that we could ask, and before I finish, I'm giving you notice of this question, Secretary General uh, of the OES, and ask if you're going to put the power of the OES behind the, 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 the claim that uh, Ms. Parson and me that the big countries of the Americas can stand behind the Caribbean as they move forward in this twin approach to debt relief. I'm going to give you notice so you can think about it before you I didn't give you notice. I might just I'll go to the audience first and then come back to that. Now, we have time for some comments from our distinguished uh, brothers and sisters in the audience. Any comments? There's a microphone somewhere. You're going to make a comment. Are you going to get the microphone? Good morning. I'm from the International Monetary Fund. And um, <laughs> we're in the audience. We're, we're supposedly keeping a very low profile here. <laughs> Uh, however, of course, I listened with great interest to the very important points that were made this morning. Um, coming back to you saying how it looks from Washington, we're all aware in, in this room with this distinguished group how important these issues are. What I, what I don't feel when I look at preparations for ADIS is that the message is getting through to the rest of the international community. We, we risk. Uh, making these points and everyone agreeing with them, but not getting the support of the international community. And I fear that Addis will go by without a, a concrete proposals. So I think that there was never a more important time for the governments of the Caribbean to make the point that small islands are a, a legitimate special group whose vulnerabilities need recognition. And also, as Ms. Mohammed so importantly put it, to offer something on the accountability side. If the international community were to take up this cause, how, how would the case be made that uh, it wasn't a free lunch for countries that continue to ask for privilege? So I, I think there was never a more important time to, to convince the rest of the international community that this is, is, should be undertaken. Thank you very much. Your message is quite loud and clear. We must have a effective advocacy for it. Is that right? That's uh, what you're putting. Yes, absolutely. Good. Thank you very much. Any other? Yes, please. Warren, you're going to come? Sorry, Papa Smith, you're going to Yes. Thank you very much. There's two, two uh, interventions I want to make, and uh, one is a teasing question. So, are we a bit soft on the issue of reparatory justice and reparations? as a key component of dealing with the whole question of, of debt. And the next issue is, shouldn't we not be taking this issue of tackling the debt uh, question to a forum where we plan for an international dialogue on Caribbean debt relief and structure it within that context? Those are my two interventions. Well, I, I, let me respond to the first. I'm sure during the course of the next day, two days, this is going to be an issue that is the discussed in depth. And I said a forum, I think exactly what our colleague from the IMF was proposing, and what I would leave it in the very capable hands of our Secretary General to think of the appropriate forum in which this may be articulated and some uh, concrete proposals made. 
as a many technical aspects, as uh, the minister pointed out, many technical aspects that would have to be worked out. But there's no doubt about the need for this kind of uh, 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 forum, Dr. Smith. So it, that's it. That's and I think that's the answer to your question, Minister. That uh, there will be no doubt this further discussion of this in terms of directory justice during the heads meeting. And secondly, I think the, the Secretary General will take on board your comment of the need to structure a forum in which this is, this is uh, uh, discussed. And the third point is the need for advocacy. Advocacy doesn't come about uh, sui generis. How to structure the advocacy for that? And she pointed out one of the immediate targets for this advocacy would be Alice. And it's not too late to have <coughs> advocacy target a group of Dr. Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me say that it is so nice to know that somebody else in this room has a hobby horse on the issue of, of debt. Thank you very much, Alicia. I think I've made four speeches since I've become president of the CDB, and they have all included the issue of debt, the importance of addressing indebtedness in the Caribbean. I'm talking here about sovereign indebtedness. Um, I, I'd just like to make a couple of points. First of all, the tractability of debt relief. Uh, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. There are several examples of how uh, debt relief can be implemented in different parts of the world. Right here in the Caribbean, uh, there was the HIPIC initiative. Now that HIPIC initiative, uh, the jury might be out as to whether across the board it, it worked well, but um, there have been some success cases. And um, my own view is that when we are articulating the case for debt relief, it is very important that we take on board some of the points, in particular the point that has been made by uh, Adrian from the IMF. Uh, in my opinion, the sustainability of debt relief is what is going to give credibility to the case. In other words, we cannot put ourselves in a position where we get debt relief and we're having a discussion about indebtedness five, ten years down the road again. So that uh, we have responsibility in the matter so that what we need to do is even as we make the case for that debt relief, we need to demonstrate to those with whom we are negotiating that we are prepared to take the tough decisions, and they are tough, to do the right things. I spoke in my presentation this morning about the, um, the world around us having changed. We need to change the structure of our economies. We can't continue to do what we have done in the past and expect a different result. So that is part of what is our responsibility. Uh, the last point I'd like to make is uh, the one that I would like to speak to a point which was made about the role of multilaterals. Uh, I have made the point before that um, it is possible for multilaterals to play a critical role in helping countries to address debt, their debt problems. I made the point at one, one meeting in the IMF in Montego Bay a, couple year, a year ago that uh, in the case of St. Kitts and Nevis, the CDB stepped up to the plate when the country of St. Kitts and Nevis made the decision that they wanted fundamentally to address their economic issues. That country at the time had a debt to GDP ratio of about 160%. It was higher even than Jamaica's. Uh, what CDB did was CDB used its balance sheet, the strength of its balance sheet, to stand behind the debt restructuring exercise. In other words, we said to the creditors who were being asked to take a substantial haircut on the principal and also on, on the coupons, that we would stand behind the new bonds. But what it required is that St. Kitts Nevis themselves take some very, very tough decisions on their fiscal side. Right? And what we have done is we have challenged the other multilaterals to use their much larger balance sheets to help the larger countries in the Caribbean who have, in relative terms, larger debt exposures to uh, adjust their, their, uh, their debt situation and put them on a more sustainable path. So the issue, just to summarize my point, is it is doable. All it requires is a little bit of flexibility 
a little bit of creativity in financial engineering, we can get the job done. But sustainability is important. So we have responsibility in the matter. We need to step up and do our part, even as we make the case that the other countries and the multilaterals provide the relief that we need. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Yes, please. Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let me say from the outset that I support debt reduction and debt relief. I also want to say that I see it as a short-term issue, and I hope that we do not see it as a long-term issue, because I think increasing productivity is something that we should be focusing on, and we, it's very important to recognize our workers and our investors, and they must understand that they have a role to play in these times, because if we do not do that, then every time we will be asking for debt relief. Thank you very much. I would like it to uh, a discussion to talk, turn only around that relief. So I'd like to hear a few more points in relationship to other issues raised. Another yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. George. Um, I, I represent the Caribbean Tourism Organization, so it's a, a different perspective. There's a school of thought that says that nothing happens until someone sells something. Uh, I, I subscribe to that school of thought, and we uh, need help in selling the something that we sell the best. Our biggest export in a number of our countries is, is tourism. And we do so fairly effectively in terms of our ability to uh, stand eye to eye uh, in that very competitive arena. But we have difficulty finding the means to market ourselves effectively. Were we to be able to do that, we would certainly get more plane loads of people delivering the foreign exchange into our countries that we absolutely need to reduce the debt that we've been talking about. So are there some mechanisms that we are missing in the international community uh, to allow us the funding that we need to market ourselves effectively because if we could find that funding, uh, we'd reduce the length of time that we need to talk about some of the, the debt that we have, and we subsequently would certainly reduce the, some of the debt that we have. Let me, let me ask you a question, if I might. Sure. Uh, in his presentation in Samoa, our Prime Minister referred to the, the, the similarities in that part of the world across the seas. Do you see the question that you're posing as far as tourism is concerned? having relevance, having salience to other states. Absolutely it does. Uh, the, the advantage that we have in this part of the world uh, is that we, even though tourism is such an incredibly uh, competitive activity, we in the Caribbean know that the only reason we don't do um, better at it is because we are not able to uh, fund the marketing of ourselves. So, so there are similarities for sure, but we feel that we're sitting on an advantage which if we had the funding to really tout, uh, we, right. we, that's, that's the issue. All right, thanks very much. Any other questions? Please. Uh, thank you. Please. Thank you very much, Pamela Cole Hamilton, Executive Director for the Export Development Agency. Um, my issue is completely different, and it's related to education. You know, there's a saying, Chancellor, that if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always got. And one of my biggest challenges in the region has been the way our education system has continued to function. We've not changed a lot of how we teach, and therefore how our children are learning. We're now in the 21st century. Our children, especially our boys, are being left behind in droves. I have a son. I see the fundamental difference between how he learns when he uses apps, when he uses particular, you know, use social media, as opposed to the reading, writing, arithmetic, and what, writing on the chalkboard and memorizing and regurgitating. There has to be a fundamental shift in how we do what we do in terms of the education in this region, or we're going to continue to get what we've always got. What I wanted to find out is, is there a plan with respect to addressing the significant shortfall in our education and, and the way we are approaching education, one. And I know Sir Hillary is, is vested in this issue. And secondly, what about our boys? Now I know, notwithstanding the grand gentlemen that are all seated here, and you know, there are lots of you, and, you know, 
But I guarantee you if this continues in 20 years, this will not be the case. Now maybe that's a good thing. Prime Minister Miller, you know, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying it may not be what you necessarily want in terms of equity. And so I think that that is something that we have to address both from a social standpoint, an education standpoint, and an economic standpoint. Is there a plan for our boys and our education system so that socially when we talk about domestic violence and other issues that these things are related? Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this week. Our colleague over there, our lady over there, wanted to take a comment. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but what do you call it? Sorry, please. Good, good, good afternoon, I think it is, to all who is Black Men, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Youth. I have listened to everything that has transpired, and I agree with what has been said. But the question that lingers for me is, after the debt relief, what? Um, we also heard about restructuring of economies and so on. And my friend from CELA, she spoke to part of the issue that I was going to address, and that is education. I had the privilege of visiting Prince Edward Island and looking at the interaction between their university and their people. Not, very little was taught in that university that was not relevant to the economy itself. In other words, they met the demands of their society so that when their residents, their, their people went to university to study, they knew exactly why they were pursuing what they were pursuing because it blended perfectly with the goals of that community. I tend to think that sometimes we lose sight of that in the Caribbean. We go to university, we study to get a degree. But sometimes we do not always plan in our curriculum to meet the needs of our society. So a lot of our young people leave university and then there's no work. Um, so you speak then to the relevance of the educational system. Okay. The other point is, um, former Prime Minister of Jamaica spoke at one of the presentations in Bahamas a conference there about leveraging the cultural and human assets of the region to assist in our economic development. And I think that sometimes we still think to the we still stick to the traditional when we have other assets that can be deployed to assist in diversifying our community. Okay. Right? For example, CTO, tourism. Our tourism in the Caribbean is a mature offering. We need diversification. Okay. And this is where culture can help. Right. And culture can also help as a tool in changing mindsets. Because we can use what culture has as a medium to change a lot of the mindsets that we have. Okay. But I think it's the forgotten asset. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I have the ladies over here? Thank you very much, Chair. Chantal Malrone, um, Executive Director for the Caribbean Policy Development Center, which is a regional non-governmental organization. Um, a couple of points. I want to return a little bit to the discourse on debt relief and to suggest that... I would hope, I would hope you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would perhaps in a different way, uh, if, if, if you permit me. I think that that has to be part of a larger discourse in which we begin to interrogate very much the kind of economic model. Um, that we are placed with and to suggest that unless we do that we will be perhaps spinning top in mud because it isn't only about the issue of debt relief, debt, debt relief but it's also about how we do our trade agreements. Um, it's also about that discourse that frames the discussion about how we do reparations so that unless we kind of deal very frontally with the economic model in which we are inserted we will be continuing to have different discussions about debt relief that perhaps will take us only to very short term um, solutions. Second point has to be with about the extent to which we um, involve our private sector in a discourse which allows them um, to really engage in a way that is just as much rent seeking as is also socially conscious, uh, if that is at all possible. The extent to which we can 
help them to understand that it's not only about the extent to which they are drivers supposedly of the economy, but to think very much about what type of economy. To think very much about that helix that you refer to, um, that it is not just about rent seeking, but rent seeking for what? And for what is the shape of the society that we are trying to build? And finally, um, I, I also want to suggest um, for us very frankly in the context of the SDGs that the litmus test has to be the extent to which we can have the um, realistic validity and testing about how do we ensure that we bring those voices that Ms. Mohammed um, talked about so eloquently um, to, the, to the front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I have the final comment here by me, and then I'm going to ask the panelists each one minute each to make a comment because I've been instructed that I have. Sorry, I'm sorry. Your penultimate comment. Thank you, Patrick Todd, Minister Stephen Barbados. I would focus on the post 2015 agenda. I met Ms. Mohammed uh, a year and a half ago at the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Forum, focusing on this in uh, London. And she pointed out to us that whereas in the development of the Millennium Development Goals, it was um, found that uh, the, a lot of the decisions were taken from the top and went down, and we were trying to move from the bottom up. It is argued that the West Indian Federation failed for the post war because there wasn't sufficient buy-in from the masses. So I'm just taking this opportunity to invite us all to engage the masses who may not you know, have the necessary education to attend town hall meetings, but they are very much interested in national and regional development. And if we get their, uh, if we get the moral sort of uh, authority from them, in terms of their buy-in, then we can promote the regional integration movement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Prime Minister, do you want to make a comment? Oh, well, that was really the last comment. You have each one minute, because I've been given strict instructions, you cannot delay the Prime Minister's lunch. So let us begin with uh, Ms. Ahmad. One minute. I'm prepared to get the answer, but uh, on the wrong way. Uh, I have already answered that, that during the, the nine months of campaign that they put the whole weight of the organization of the American state behind a solution for the Caribbean debt. I also have said very clearly that we need a hemispherical solution for countercyclical measures. That means what uh, Alicia has said. And I also said that we need to rise up fund for nat against natural disasters that could be the, a, a way also to make not only the first step, but step one, two, three, and four. That means to have projects, to execute the projects, to have according to a, a chronogram. Plus, plus, I think we have to, we need to, uh, I need to want to address the education uh, story that uh, we, uh, we are trying to create in the inter-American inter system an inter-American educational system, like the OPS, but for the education, in order to, be, to make the countries to absorb the better practices and to the better policies that can exist about that. And, of course, to reinforce the scholarships for uh, Caribbean students. Thank you very much. Excellent. 59 seconds. <laughs> yes, it's Barcelona. One minute. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to, to acknowledge the presence of Diane Quarles, my director of the Caribbean Court of Spain office, because they are the ones who are really behind this work I presented here. I want also to announce that there is a disc at, at your disposal. It's really a key of all the uh, documents that we have produced recently. And I'm giving to the ministers here, as I promise, but there is a lot of them outside. My uh, 50 seconds. I think that the, um, the expectations of the Caribbean people can only be achieved if we really move forward in this direction of opening space for the governments themselves to, to, to deal with the development of their people. 12% unemployment, 25% of youth unemployment is the target. From my perspective, the four sectors I will definitely concentrate in the, in, in the planning, in the long term perspective in the Caribbean would be number one, to substitute the food import bill. Five billion dollars is a major drain of food imports. So there has to be a focus on the agricultural sector. Second, 
the energy links, renewables, again, this is another big drain for, for some countries of the Caribbean, there are other producers. Uh, third, I would say that the economic restructuring and the diversification, moving from primary tourism and offshoring uh, financing to high value added products, tourism mix, medical tourism, new niches of ICT, and of course, education, but instead of high level education only, <coughs> let's move also to skills. I really have, want to pay tribute to, to the countries that have made a tremendous offer. Jamaica is, uh, uh, give, uh, is funding 6% of the GDP on education. Barbados, 5%. St. Lucia, 4%. These are the levels of the OECD countries. So there's a lot of effort that is already being done. So uh, finally, Mr. Chairman, I want to offer CEPAL, ECLAC. ECLAC is for the Caribbean countries. And our main job is, of course, we have an office for the Caribbean. Of course, we are ready to work with Caribbean. But we are also ready to bring on board the large economies of Latin America to talk about Caribbean. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Listen. Chair, well, let, me, let me go back to the, the management issue and say that we cannot expect for the savings we get from the management restructuring can be spent to put us back into the same position again. Those savings have got to be really potential issue. Because if we go back to increase our level of expenditure, we're going to find ourselves back in the same position in a few years' time. Let me also say that even while we look at a number of the issues that have been raised here, many of them are medium term to long-term issues. And there is a fundamental requirement to deal with the matters now. Which brings us to the issue that you rarely has raised, where we've got to put the appropriate amount of funding into getting growth in the sectors that we are known for. We've got to get the growth in our tourism up, not necessarily by going to the same markets we've always been to, by going to different markets, because that drives, that drives a whole lot of other activity in our economies. It drives the cultural activities, it drives some of the uh, manufacturing activities, it drives some of the agricultural activities. We also have got, Chair, and I'm going to be more than a minute, I have to tell you. No, please. Uh, um, we also have got to deal with this matter of using the voice of the states in the only forum that allows us to count of the UN for. And we have, in the last few, maybe 10 years, walked away a bit from the table. We need to put on, on the table continuously, every forum we go to, particularly at the UN forum where they need our votes, the matter of the access to concessional funding for middle income countries and the matter of debt relief. Debt relief doesn't mean you have a cut principle, it may mean that too. But war is right when you cut the principle, you have to, you can only do so in the context where the people recognize that you've taken the hard decisions that you have to take to run the economy. And, and, and sure, the matter of the concession financing, we don't mean grants. We mean, let's say, solve money off, and if we get us some grants, we are happy with that. But <coughs> that is absolutely required. How is St. Lucia going to protect this coast? How is Barbados going to let this coast? Okay. How are you? No, I'm not finished yet. We're going to give a little bit of time. But the issue we need to raise, for many of us, financial and international financial and business services account for almost 10% of GDP in some of our economies, more in some instances. The world has gone quiet on the matter of protecting the sovereignty of small countries who wish to exert the tax, the mobility of tax, the rules. And even when we do everything right with the book, we are still backlisted. And there will be some more countries. This is something we have to put back on the United Nations agenda, and it must stay there. We will do everything else, and then it will agenda. Because the countries cannot themselves fund the growth by borrowing, our private sectors have got to come forward. If they don't come forward, we have to find some foreigners to come forward. But you know, we prefer to have foreigners mixed with locals. 
because that way we, we can sort of more influence to make sure that things get done the way they ought to be done. But the growth has to come from the private sector. And but and sure, we cannot do the debt restructuring or the fiscal policies unless the growth is also occurring. Thank you. You cannot claim ministerial privilege. No, no. <laughs> I, I will do no such thing. What? I just want to say, uh, <laughs> say really, that I agree with that, Minister, that one the key, two things. One of the key things is that we must continue with vigorous international engagement and we should not recoil from it, particularly in critical um, issues and multilateral environmental agreements like climate change, for which we are not responsible, but we are paying the heaviest debt. So I think we have to continue engaging there. And secondly, I think along with that, we must um, at the same time be bold and use some opportunities that are there that we're now, not, now currently using. For example, we've seen, we've developed the CRIF, the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, that has worked pretty well for us. But there are other opportunities like ocean thermal energy conversion that really is crying out for use in our regions. We are particularly well placed to use those. They're well suited technologies for small island developing states. I've been engaging Minister Eswick with this for a long time. He's actually very keen on that, those issues, but I do not know still why we are so slow on the uptake. So I think that there's some things that we ourselves can do in turn. Thank you very much. Well done. Okay, excuse you, excuse you three minutes because there's agenda deficit here. <laughs> Uh, the first issue on financing for development, um, to my colleague from the IMF, um, what is very clear is that the only professionals in the room are the multilateral institutions. Everybody else who's negotiating is from foreign affairs, is from development. Very, very few come from capital consistently through these negotiations. So it is important for us to give some assistance to the solutions that we can put on the table so the outcome document for financing for development in Addis can actually be concrete in terms of its deliverables. And we, have, we, we, we really do need to give the SIDS a, a hand there. There has been discussion on the floor which looks at um, LDCs um, and the sort of uh, concessional funding, and there has been a case that's been made for SIDS and their vulnerabilities, but it's not strong enough. And not strong enough is because it, it just the capacity is not there. And if you see that, then offer the solutions so that we can strengthen those um, constituencies to do better. I think that we do need to see um, that you use more of your regional institutions. Africa used CAP, the Common African Position, and they used ECA, they used the African Development Bank, um, and they really did move issues on the table. And I think using ECLA, using the ACP, really finding those institutions that can give you voice there is going to be incredibly important. Um, on the private sector, um, again, uh, the private sector, unlocking resources, resources are there, a huge amount of private equity, but those that want to move it can't find the instruments to put them in environments that they, will put inverted commas, are enabling. And, and the multilateral system has to look at that. They have to help find those instruments to open up, uh, unlock those resources, because they're there. We know that we, they're, they're there and that they can be used. And I think that we're seeing more and more business coming up and saying, we will do it, but we need to find um, uh, the partners to make that happen. Uh, they are also changing their core business models. The discussions in business in the post-2015 has gone beyond corporate social responsibility to really ask about what they're doing to change their core business models that will become much more friendly um, to, to people of the planet. Finally, on ed education, I think that it's incredibly important that we address today and tomorrow. There are millions of young boys who have not had an education. What are you going to do with them? It's about today, it's about the millions that don't have it. We have to find an education system that will retool them. And, and if we don't, then it's not going to make any sense because no matter what we do, we would have excluded and left a critical part of our populations behind. And it's no, it doesn't matter what you do to a woman educating her, she's got to get married. And if she doesn't get married, she has to have a partner. And then you'll start, start talking about gender violence. Um, we, you, you, we have so many issues that, that the implications for not educating everybody and taking them along um, are, are critical. So I think those of now is what we have to take part of. Going forward, we used to have plans for what we need. They were called manpower ministries or manpower departments, and now we'll say they're human resources. But we don't have them anymore. They will really look at what do we need to produce amongst our population in the education base for the public sector and for the markets. 
But we don't do that anymore. The public sector is devoid of the skills that we need to address the kind of development challenges that we have today. That has to have come out of an education system that just doesn't happen anymore. I think we need to rethink education, not in the old colonial model, but in a way in which it actually responds to our country's needs and puts us right up front with skills uh, that, that make sense to um, joining that, that political, um, that, the, the, the global economy. Last but not least, I will make a plea. This agenda will not work unless we really find ways internally, within our countries, within our communities, to make the voices work for implementation. We cannot implement this agenda without the people, especially young people. And that's what it's got to be about. And if we learned anything from the past mistakes is that we excluded far too many. This is an agenda about leaving your own land. Thank you. So you have 60 seconds, let me be precise. Thank you, Sir George. Uh, uh, this morning, uh, Sir George, um, SG uh, Sharma spoke about the, the power of ideas to frame a new paradigm. And uh, we heard from uh, Mr. Riley of the CTO about the power of ideas. I think uh, I, I need to say something about that. What is, clear to me, what is clear to me is that our development agenda, our development momentum has slowed considerably. Uh, we are anxious about uh, having it rekindled. And many of the problems we discussed this morning, whether they were the, 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 the modernization of boys and, and the, the, the lack of throughput from graduates, all of those things are part of the, the frustrating effects of what really is a slowing economy and, and doubt about whether we can have it rekindled. But at the same time, I think we need to look at those external shocks that we heard about and the internal inhibitions that we said we must discuss. We need to see both the external shocks issue as well as the internal inhibitions. What are the forces that are holding back the potential of Caribbean people on the inside? The, the, the issue of citizenship is important in all of this. We, we do not think our citizens in the Caribbean are not as democratically engaged as they ought to be. Uh, we know they're voting the parliamentary process. But the issue of economic engagement of citizens is still a big problem for us. Our economies are managed by elites and small minorities. Our wealth is controlled by small minorities. We have not democratized the wealth. We have not brought the people into wealth generation. We are still running minority economies. And this is an issue. And citizens must participate in economic life as a matter of course. The, the issue of voice is important. This relates to the lack of diversity in our economies. If you take an examination of all of our tertiary institutions, what you will find is that the boys have not retreated from higher education. The boys are going into science and technology faculties. The only faculties where the boys are the majority is science and technology because the boys are looking for a certain kind of activity. They're not going to humanities because traditionally they went there and became civil servants. They do not wish to go into the public sector. They wish to go into the private sector and they go into science, technology, that's where they go. That's where the boys are going. So yes, we need to diversify the economic system to allow the boys to have an output. But I agree with all of you who said the higher education system has to be realigned. It has to be a realigned to the economies. It has to be restructured to accommodate economic growth. It has to be reorganized to push innovation. And that is precisely the point which I wish to discuss tomorrow. Thank you very much for the, for the ability. So yes, uh, I think we have a question before us of re rekindling the Caribbean revolution. We need to rekindle it. We, we need to find the ideas to rebuild the confidence we always had, to re-energize ourselves once again. This is the second phase of nation building. Our countries have now been independent 50 years. This is the second phase we're going into and we need more energy and we need new ideas. So I say, Chancellor, let us take the new guards and let us find a way to sit and rekindle the Caribbean revolution of self-reliance, independence, and sovereignty. Thanks very much. Yes, I want to take off from where, where Sir Hillary just left off and the question that Pam raised. It's interesting to know that our boys are not achieving in, in high school in particular. But that in the labor market, surveys indicate that the boys continue to excel in jobs in technology, which are the more higher paying jobs. The boys have an aptitude for that, and the, the, the women are not going in, the young girls are not going into that. And I think it stems from the fact that we are teaching our kids in analog while they're thinking digitally. And that calls for the reform and the revamp of the education system.
system? And the answer to Pam's question is yes, in fact. That we are looking at, 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 the, at the whole gamut of education. There's need for education reform. Uh, because Joe's did a tremendous amount of work about a year ago with us in Secretariat and pointed to what he called wasted the education system that just simply must be, must be addressed and the education system must be the mandate for the type of society that we're trying to achieve. The next point I want to address very briefly is the point raised by Minister Steve Lashley about a forum. And a forum doesn't have to be a meeting necessarily or a sit-down place while these are required. And we continue to engage the IFIs in Washington. It's also about the advocacy. And we have to aim our shots as well at the OECD countries, the G7, the G8, the G20, which influence the international financial policy and international financial architecture. I was hearing just recently that the pushback we're getting in the discussions in, in New York on the, on the, um, the, the sustainable um, sorry, the development financing issues are from the, the G20 countries, I'm sorry, the G7 countries. So that advocacy is necessary. And finally, the issue of debt has to be coupled with growth. And we must tackle, as, as um, Lisa has mentioned, the issue of the rent seekers. Too many of our, of our large investors keep our governments to ransom by saying, if you don't continue to renew fiscal incentives, we're going to leave you. And that has to be addressed address collectively, addressing the issue of rent. Thank you very much. I think our panel has done very well. Uh, the program, the pro thank you all very much. The program has called for comments, uh, closing remarks by the chair. I'm not going to do that. Uh, uh, I know lunch is persuading. Uh, as Elizabeth Taylor said to her sixth husband, I will not keep you long. Uh, I, want to, I want to thank the government, uh, the presenters, and the audience uh, for their participation. And the title of the dialogue, Climate Societies, Resilient Economies, and a Partnership with Development. I think there's been, we've heard a lot here that is uh, contributory to this idea and will certainly enhance the discussions that we'll have, that you will have over the next couple of days. I think the ideas of those two being partners, the, that it should be partnership, it's going to be genuine human development, has surfaced throughout all of the discussions. And when we decide to, to, to broaden remit, and to deal with resilience as an as a, as a underlying theme. I think that was well uh, uh, done, and I must thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for what they did to put this in place. Uh, Minister, you and your staff have done. You have done a tremendous, a tremendous, this is not tell me to stop. They've done a tremendous uh, uh, job in uh, uh, putting this together. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. And the resilience in terms of these three dimensions is social, social resilience, uh, human res uh, 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 economic resilience, and environmental resilience are brought out very clearly to all the presentations in the first half and the second half. I, it would be bordering on the pathetic if I were to attempt to uh, uh, revisit and analyze and synthesize what was said in those. And we look at some of the problems of social resilience. We didn't cover all of the aspects of social resilience. Some of them were mentioned, aspect of civic resilience, aspects of the resilience of the almost the native the native uh, concept of association of the Caribbean peoples, the social capital that we brought with us, the, the, the susus, the meeting terms, all of those kinds of things that we brought from us really are manifestation of the social capital, which is used but not We spoke, many people spoke of the issue of gender equality, the excessiveness of discrimination against women as being an aspect of the social resilience which we need to cultivate and not take for granted. The reference on the human capital and institutions in which Ms. Mohammed uh, believes so deeply, uh, I think was very well articulated, very well mentioned by several of the persons. And I like, it didn't uh, surface often enough, the idea of the business sector. I always conceive of the state of comprise of being pluralist and comprising the civil society, the public sector, and the private sector. And I like the point this Mohammed made that we have to move beyond the traditional appreciation of the private sector, being interested only in philanthropy or corporate social responsibility. If your shared value in the public sector is one that's becoming very much overall, and is one I encourage us to entertain that the business sector, in, in terms of shared value, can be a tremendous ally in terms of progress, and not only and not uh, 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 an adversary. 
the idea of collectivity and the partnerships, I thought it was very well <laughs> explained. Going back again, I think our Caribbean's natural tendency for partnership, uh, part of our culture, part of our tradition. And I would like please to know uh, in some of the comments from Samoa that this appeared to be the type of culture that uh, also uh, was present in those parts and for which we have some almost a, 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 a affinity. The concept note suggested that we might put some issues that would be brought before the meeting of the Secretary General with CARICOM. And one of these I'd like to suggest is the issue of accountability, which Mohammed, as Mohammed articulated, and the variability in accountability. Because who is accountable to whom and for what varies? It is not an absolute. Uh, two years ago, the Secretary General of the UN, in a conference, we spoke of the dawning of the new age of accountability, which brought back memories of, of here. The dawning of the new age of accountability. And I think he's correct that it can't be seen only in terms of who makes the accounts and who gives the accounts as being one fixed uh, 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 set of para uh, 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 parameters. So I, I would hope that that is one of the issues. And how can the, 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 the UN help the Caribbean in this particular instance? And the point cannot be overstated. For there to be accountability, there have to be accounts. And for there to be accounts, there have to be the kind of data that allow for uh, transparency in the presentation of the uh, 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 accounts. I cannot overstate the point that the Secretary of Commerce made about quality, equality as a, as a dynamism, a dynamic culture uh, 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 for, for, for growth. In physical terms, there's inherent tension. Uh, and if you have unequals, and the, the idea that you should treat uh, un, uh, unequals the same is one that has bedeviled us. It comes back to this, the issue of uh, 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 vulnerabilities. And my good friend, Frida Rambo, makes the point that we should have learned that from Aristotle's politics. Aristotle said, but that the unequal should be given to equals and the unlike to those who are alike is contrary to nature. And nothing that is contrary to nature is good. As some of us say, the greatest form of inequality is to treat unequals equally. And that is what has happened to many of our smaller countries. They have treated unequal, e unequals equally. And we should have learned that, uh, say, from the Aristotle made at least before the thesis over 200 years ago. Uh, the issue we cannot ignore, and I think what would be the second issue that we might put uh, Secretary General before in your discussions with the UN Secretary General, is the issue that uh, Ms. Barson, Ms. Barson put on the anvil, the issue of debt. And with all its ramifications, as we pointed out by Warren Smith, as we pointed out several persons here, of course it has ramifications. As the minister pointed out, it's not only debt, it's concession financing, it's not only the most radical debt, it's the commercial debt, et cetera, et cetera. It is a difficult problem. But difficulty is not an obstacle in itself. Difficulty is a challenge. And I would hope that we can be up to that challenge to present this issue in such a way as to garner the, garner the support of those who need to be supported. I was very pleased here, the Secretary General of OS pointed out his decision to mobilize the countries of the Americas behind the Caribbean in something of this nature, even though the OS is not a financial uh, 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 institution. So all claims for differential, differential vulnerabilities is a claim that can be validated and expressed in concrete, in concrete terms. Uh, I would hope that uh, the issue of partnerships in pressing these claims would uh, go forward and within the context of the collectivity that which the Prime Minister spoke, how there can be this collectivity and connectivity between ourselves and the SIDS should be an issue that should uh, 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 resonate in the discussions you might have with it. Pardon me being uh, uh, also arrogant enough to suggest what, what, what that agenda uh, uh, consists of. So one is the accountability uh, uh, mechanism, the issue uh, and of what goes along with it, the issue of debt and what might happen to it and how it might be uh, addressed and, 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 and put forward. It might be these kinds of things that you might uh, uh, put, a couple of the things that you might put before the Secretary General. And finally, and this is my last final, and finally, uh, the issue of who makes these decisions. As it was pointed out, when one of the criticisms of the Millennium Development Goals, it was done by what is known as the traditional box art method. I don't know if you know what the box art method is. It's a well-described te technique in managerial terms. 
is a bunch of guys sitting around a table. This is what actually happened. Uh, it, uh, if you read the history of the uh, NDGs, this is essentially how they were, were, were developed. And the SDGs have been completely different, as Ms. Mohammed would point out, as she so elegantly pointed out, elegantly and eloquently pointed out in a presentation of the Secretary General's Road to Dignity, that is different. The consultation has been the, uh, the name of the game. And in the consultation, there has been such a variety of ideas, such a flourish of ideas, that the problem has been how to distill these into some uh, small numbers that affect the majority of the people who need the SDGs more than the, a small minority in the world. So once again, let me thank you very much for attending. I hope you've uh, enjoyed this interactive discussion. Good afternoon.